I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the November 13th meeting of the Cross Hill Township Public Services Commission. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, Allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, I'd like a uh, motion to approve the agenda. So moved. So moved. Is it supported? Is it supported? We approve the agenda. Are there any additions, deletions? If not, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 The agenda is approved. <clears throat> Before we start the meeting tonight, um, I'd like to um, introduce the newest member of our commission, who's not new to the township. Les Schmidtke. Les is on the end. Hi, Les. Welcome. Thank you. And um, Les is a long-time employee, I think close to 40 years, maybe or over 40 years? 43 years. 42 years, and retired from the township the water department uh, when? January 1st, 2010. Well, Les is, uh, brings to the commission a wealth of knowledge and history about the public works on Gross Hill. And uh, welcome. We're very pleased that you're joining us, Les. Thank you. Anything you'd like to say to start with? Well, I'd like to thank Ted Van Oz. But, uh, he's the one that got a hold of my ear. And John Riley, both of them bent my ear to come aboard. Well, very good. We're glad that you're here. And uh, it's very timely that you start tonight because on the agenda tonight, we're going to have a report from our engineers. Uh, a bit regarding our master water plan and a, what I would call a reliability study. It's an update of our water system. We're going to get a report on that tonight, so it's very timely, Les, that you're, you've joined us this evening. <clears throat> and in the audience tonight, and I'll introduce our engineers, but we have a number of staff people. Uh, our, ta our township manager, Dale Riom, is here. Uh, John Kine from our water department is here. And Joel Keefe from our wastewater treatment plant. In addition to um, Kevin Cook and Sahil Sabak uh, from Rains Engineering. Good. And then, uh, with respect to Rains Engineering and Sohio and the people there, Charlie Rains recently passed away uh, approximately a week and a half or so ago. And I came to know Charlie Rains over the years when I was on the township board as a treasurer. And we did a lot of things. Sohio, I think, was brand new on deck at that time. And there were many things that were done uh, with Charlie's aid and assistance. Things that I think about are the public safety building, that's the police and fire building, the bike path, and maybe Les Schmitke would have a little something uh, that he remembers that would be interesting with respect to Charlie Rance. He was a good guy and it's hard to see him uh, pass away. Well, I remember I talked to Charlie and uh, I said that we needed to replace the water main on McComb Street because when we had water main breaks, the sanitary sewer was right next to the water main, and it was all sand, and it was just nothing but a, a pure mess. And when we had a main break on, on Macomb Street, we'd be putting people out of business and out of work. So Charlie and I, uh, I he says, well, where do you think we can put it? So I grabbed a paper towel out of my truck, put it on the hood of the truck, and I says, here. And I drew it down the south side of the road, underneath the sidewalk. And I says, that's where they need to put it so it's away from that sanitary sewer. Charlie said, give me that. And that's how it, he took that back to the office and that's how that water main got done on Macomb Street. <laughs> Very good. Is that still in the archives, Les? <laughs> <laughs> have to ask the hire if he's still there. <laughs> oh, it's a friend. <laughs> And uh, what I, I find interesting, so he was a young man then, eh? Yeah, <laughs> he was. <laughs> well, Kevin certainly still is. So there you go. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome to everybody that's in the uh, meeting room tonight. And Les, thanks for your comments. <clears throat> Next is, um, we have minutes of two meetings. And um, so first is the September 11th meeting. Um, I hope everybody's had a chance to read the minutes, and I look forward for a motion to approve. So moved. Support. Moved supported that the minutes of our September 11th meeting be approved as distributed. Any comments? Hearing none, all in favor, keep by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
the minutes are approved. We have minutes of our October 9th meeting. You've had a chance to look at those. Uh, entertain a motion to approve. So move. Approve or support. Move supported that the October 9th minutes be approved as distributed. Any comments? If not, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. We have approval of bills. Vouchers uh, found on page 13 through 19 of your packet. I looked the bills over. I didn't see anything out of order or any questions. Um, if there are any, we'd like any questions. We should first have a motion to approve. So moved. Support. 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 Moved. Supported that the vouchers found on pages 13 through 19 in our packet be approved as distributed. Any questions? Yeah, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I uh, I have a I, I, a quick question just. Uh, so I better understand what all these things mean. Uh, on page 15, they're not big amounts, but what caught my eye was that it seems they're the same department and the same amount, and it's an odd number, like at the bottom for Island, Sino um, Island Service. You have uh, <coughs> Department 590 on the same day having two charges of 2517. There's probably two bills put together double bills, two invoices, and that's how they probably split it up. Okay. Water and sewer. Well, but isn't, uh, uh, am I reading this wrong? Isn't the, I mean, they're both for Department 590, and the ones below them are both for 591, and they're the same amounts. Correct. So. <laughs> the, the, yeah, probably the, for two vehicles, and it was the same amount for each vehicle. Yeah. And we just did it individually like that. Two different invoices. Okay. <laughs> All right. And the spread, the spread on them generally is divided up like 70-30. 70% water, 30% okay. sewer. Okay, good question. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, and, uh, um, like, um, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The vouchers are approved. <clears throat> also on, on pages um, on 20 through 24 of our packet, we have a review of statements of revenue and expenses. This is just a Treasurer's report uh, to date of uh, the water, sewer, and refuse funds uh, expenditures to date should all be at a little over 50 percent. We're halfway through the fiscal year. They all look appropriate to me. Any questions? And on this, we'll just receive and file unless there are any questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, just okay. a, a quick question. Uh, on the first page, page 20, you have expenses uh, that are uh, uh, 243 percent of budget. And it's just the uh, generic expenses. Actually, it's the revenue. What's your line item? Uh, Which line item? On page 20. Page 20, expenditures. The revenue. It's right under total revenues. You have expenditures. Go down near the bottom, about the fourth one up. It's, oh, it says expenses, yeah. and it's 243%. Oh, I see. You'd have to pull it out. I'd have to well, pull that out. Well, it's because it was $1,000, right? And it, yeah, budget like for 1000 thousand. Yeah, I, I just yeah. wondered what it was. Yeah, I'll have, to pull, I'll have to pull it out. And okay, it out for you. thank you. Mm -hmm. So I assume it's miscellaneous expenses, but you know it's good to call that out. I mean, just expenses isn't very definitive. Yeah. So maybe you could point that out to Ann. Yep. We will find out. Okay. And I assume that since it's a small amount, Jim, that'd be okay if uh, Lorinda gets back with you. And oh, certainly. It? Yeah, that's that'd be fine. <clears throat> Any other questions? That's a good question. So we'll receive and file that report. Next, we have um, Treasurer's report. And for October of 2012, this requires a motion to approve for acceptance. So moved. Can I have support? Support. Move support of the Treasury report for October for our public service DPS funds, uh, basically water, sewer, refuse, so forth, roads, be approved as distributed. Um, all in favor indicate by saying, are there any questions? All in favor, uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Treasury report is received. Les, I want to call your attention. We started this a couple of years ago. On the back page, page 26, we asked the uh, Treasurer to uh, show that the balances in our drain fund, our bike path construction and maintenance funds, and our road improvement funds. So at least every month we get to look at what those fund balances are. Just wanted to call that to your attention. Thank you. 
All right, so we've moved through the preliminary. Now we have a, a report on our, our water system. You all have an extensive report um, that was put in our packets. It's, uh, this is entitled, a, it's an update of our water system study master plan. I also call it an, a, really a question, Sahil, it's really a reliability study update, which examines our water system, and I'll let you explain that. But our engineers from CE Range Company, Sahil Sabak and Kevin Cook, are here to make a report. And I think what we'll do is you can make your report. And I don't know if somebody has a burning question or you want to wait till the end. Uh, but it, and, and the audience is invited to ask questions too, Mr. Manager, and so forth. So. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank you all for your thoughts of sympathy about the passing of Charlie Rains. He will definitely be missed. Second, as far as the reliability study, we have prepared a report uh, to uh, meet MDEQ requirements. For the past five years, MDEQ has been pushing the township to perform a reliability study on the water system. Uh, the last study that was done was done over 26 years ago. And uh, I, I guess they're putting up pressure on uh, Barry that he couldn't uh, avoid it anymore, so he uh, recommended uh, uh, that we perform one and uh, present it to you. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Kevin Cook. He's uh, one of our project engineers. He did um, prepare the reliability study and uh, he based it all on the existing system that the township has in place now. Uh, what he will do is he'll be going through a PowerPoint presentation that delineates the outline of the report that you have in your hand then after that's done, we will address any questions you may have about uh, the study and about the system. Kevin. Good evening. Okay, the, the report that I submitted uh, for review it's based on MDQ requirements. Um, there's a lot of technical jargon and information inside the report itself. So what I've done for the presentation is I just set up a PowerPoint presentation to outline, as Ohio mentioned, some of the uh, highlights of the report and what some of the thinking was behind it. Okay, the scope of the report was broken down into to six parts, introduction, development of model, water distribution system evaluation, system improvement recommendations, improvement costs, a summary, and then we'll be taking questions at the end. The water system study master plan involves the following steps. First of all, we had to develop Girl Seal's existing water distribution system as a model network, which includes the layout of the pipes, sizes, material pipe, age of pipe, elevation, uh, age, and basically we take the system water map, overlay it on AutoCAD, which is, and add WaterCAD to it, and it actually model the flows, pressures within the report itself. The second thing, second thing we had to do was establish the water supply demands for the model. Um, this was used using uh, Detroit Waters records for each daily demands, yearly demands, hourly demands, and that was averaged over a four-year period. The initial report was completed in 2010. Um, the model was used based on those averages itself. Um, we did, for this report, update it to include the last two years of flow. It did change the average a little bit, but not enough to affect the overall development of the report itself. So once we did that, the demand uh, was basically spread across the township. We know we got, you know, an average million gallon per day. So it was used based on population density and use. Certain areas where there's higher concentrations of homes, more demand was used there. And depending on the use, restaurants, uh, different type of uh, build office buildings and that type of stuff was basically based on um, just spreading it out over to get a good model reading for the entire project. Uh, fuel hydrogen flow tests were collected for calibration of the model network. Um, basically, the model will spit out a, a series of pressures and flows, and then what we did is we took field hydrant measurements 
and compared those to what the the model was predicting and saying what's happening. So based on the field conditions, the model was calibrated. A lot of it has to do with the age of the pipe, the C factors involved. Um, so basically you take the field data and just try to blend it and work the computer model down to even out to match field conditions. And then the recommended system improvements uh, were based on the fire flow um, requirements from the MDEQ. I'm going to go on the next slide here. Okay, the existing water main distribution, there's approximately 75 miles of water main on Grill Seal. Um, this chart here lists the different sizes based on percentage. Again, this was based on old record drawings. And so there's 100,000 feet of 6-inch pipe, 175,000 feet of 8-inch pipe, 87,000 feet of 12-inch pipe, 24,000 of 16 and 5,000, approximately 5,000 feet of 24 inch. So you can see what should stand out here when doing the model is the amount of six inch. And typically most of the six inch was installed prior to 1970. So it gives you an idea all the way back to approximately 1910. So it shows you that a lot of the 25% of the pipe at Gross Seal is six inch and it's over, most of it's over 60, 50 to 60 years old. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that on this slide. Uh, the color map here shows the distribution for the water main sizes for the township. So again, there's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the six, there's two feeds for the island. There's the uh, toll bridge, there's a 16-inch that cr crosses there, supplied by DWSD, and then 24 on the county bridge. Again, this just shows a general layout of sizes. And again, the, the yellow, as you see here, this is the other side of the island, indicates the six inch pipe, which then again, it's more than, it's aged and some of the problems they've been having in the township has to do with a lot of the six inch that's been uh, installed many years ago. The model simulations were evaluated using the existing distribution network under the following demand conditions, average day, maximum day, maximum hour conditions, the flows were taken from DWSD records. So basically over those four years, the, the, the average maximum and maximum hour of the conditions were used and averaged for the report itself. Uh, the charts that I show here, um, you can see average daily flow from 2005 to 2011 was 1.34 million gallons per day. The maximum daily flows on average was up to two and a half million gallons per day, and the maximum hourly flow is for, on average, four million gallons per day, averaged out from hourly to daily. So, really shows you just basically a lot of the the maximum hourly, especially was done summer months in the morning where the demand is highest. Same with the max day flows on the average. So this kind of just gives a general idea over the years, and it stayed pretty consistent. 2000 for average daily flow, we're looking at 1.45 million gallons a day, you know, and the lowest on that end would be 1.17 in 2011. A lot of that has to do also with having us. 2012 will probably be a little higher once that data comes in because a lot of it has to do with the heat, the summer, the dryness, and watering the lawns and that type of stuff for the peak demands. And again, there's a lot more detail based on where some of these uh, factors come into in the report, but I just want to kind of highlight the charts itself. Okay, hydrogen flow tests were performed at 19 locations based on critical pressure zones. The field hydrogen pressures were compared to the computer model pressures. The computer model was then calibrated to match the field measurements. I touched on this a little bit earlier that basically you got to have some real world data to compare with the model and just the model to come up and meet those um, field measurements that you take in the field. The modeling approach for the distri distribution system evaluation was to maintain a minimum fire flow rates of 1,200 gallons per minute at a minimum pressure of 20 PSI in the system for maximum daily flow conditions. And then the other DEQ requirement was to maintain the minimum pressure of 50 PSI during maximum daily demand periods. Um, the 50 PSI is based on, that's just kind of a standard for what, what you need to, number one, to have good pressure in the system as far as 
keeping people happy in the township. If you have lower pressure now, you're going to, especially with some of the old plumbing, you can have some problems, low water pressure. So basically that's, you know, for more for residents and have an adequate pressure to do what you need to do as far as washing and watering of yards. Uh, the 1,200 gallons per minute draw at 20 PSI in the system, that is what the DEQ, basically the, just the report for recommendations for improvement is based on that. So when you have a fire, you're pulling out a minimum of 1,200 gallons per minute and you've got to be able to keep that pressure up when you're drawing. If you're drawing and your pressure reduces less than 20 PSI, number one, you're affecting your ability to fight fires, and number two, that really you're going to strain the system as far as people being able to use water for in other areas of the township. And again, like I said, there's more, a lot more detailed data, hydrant locations in the township when they were taken um, compared to the field. Okay, the fire floor evaluation, again, this is, I, re, you know, I repeated this a couple of times because this is what the improvements are based on. The MDQ requirement for a minimum hydro flow is 1,200 gallons per minute, again, with the 20 PSI. Uh, the model that we have generates, calculates, and shows locations that require improvements to meet the standard. So basically, where the model was run, and we simulate a fire flow situation where you where you pull in fire, that you need the 1,200 gallons per minute minimum of 20 psi, and that the program itself will show you areas of the um, island that don't meet that. So if you're pulling 1,200 you know, gallons per minute and you're not getting the pressure. So the model will actually tell you these areas. Now sometimes the field data, again, when the model data will differ a little bit, especially for, uh, for the gallons per minute requirement, 1,200 gallons per minute, but a lot of it has to do with, the again, the age of the material, six inch, there's debris, um, not debris, you know, sedimentation and different things within the uh, fire lines themselves, the water mains, so uh, maintenance, you know, if you fix that main a lot, there's a lot of, you know, repairs on the main and the age itself where there actually be a buildup inside the pipes will really affect that itself. So what the bottle tries to do is, okay, here's, here's a simulation. We're pulling 1,200 gallons per, per minute. Where can't we meet the 20 PSI and the 1,200 gallons per minute? And that's what the, for the reliability, right, <coughs> excuse me, the reliability report, that's what the MDQ was looking at. They wanted, okay, where's the trouble spots and what are you going to do to fix them? So I'm going to go into the next chart. And this area, this map here will show the areas, uh, the, the nodes, the circles in there. There's, this is what the model predicts as far as fire flow. The reds that you see are areas that have less than 1,200 gallons per minute that will provide. The uh, cyan color, light blue, is 1,200 gallons, between 1,200 and 15 gallons per minute. The green is 1,500 to 2,500, and the blues are 2,500 GPM or greater. So, the, so looking at this, you can see certain areas. Now, some of the areas, um, I can tell you, like on the north end of the island, there's a lot of six-inch main there connecting. You can see, I wanted to show the actual six-inch mains there. So a lot of the red dots where there's not adequate fire protection will show up on the areas where there's a lot of six-inch main and a lot of older main itself. So um, then again, the, so these are the areas, wherever you see the red dot node, these are where the model is telling us that we don't have um, adequate fire protection itself. And again, on the other end of the island, on the south end of the island, around South Point, there's a lot of areas with the red where it doesn't meet fire flow. There's, uh, you know, it's fed off of 112 coming off South Point, South Point, and it basically loops through a bunch of um, dead ends. There's no other connection there with a lot of six inch, so there's a lot of red areas in that area. And then there's some sca other scattered areas throughout the island that uh, do the six inch mains. Um, and elevations. Sometimes you'll see some of the elevations, uh, the points in the middle of the island, there's some red spots because the middle of the island's higher, you're going to have a little bit less pressure itself. Okay, although, although most of the system performs within the criteria for average day demands and maximum daily demands, there are areas that need upsizing to meet the 1,200 gallon per minute fire flows. There are other areas that need to be looped to eliminate dead ends and improve fire flow. And now this is going to bring up to the map itself where the model is saying we need to do system upgrades, pipe, ups, pipe sizing upgrades 
to meet the 1,200 gallon per minute flows between the PSI. Uh, the south end of the island along Park Lane, along Bridge and Meridian, there's some, uh, then again, I'm going back to the six inch mains that are there that need to be upsized. We're proposed looping some of those and upgrading them to 12 inch. The red areas you see are to remove and replace the six inch with eight inch water main. And there's a couple areas where there's some dead ends that a loop would, um, would help out the situation a lot. And those are on Park Lane. Um, Uh, in the area of Wood, uh, O'Donnell, and Woodcrest, there was some, for some reason back in the day when they were put in, um, there's been a lot of new development in that area back in the 70s, so there's some dead ends there, so it would be two connection points, and there's approximately, there's approximately about 1,300 feet. So those two areas off of Park Lane are the only areas that the system is telling us, okay, we need to connect these two different areas of pipe, of water being piped together to get better flows and better pressure through there. Now the majority of the rest of the areas that are showing in red and blue are replacing existing water mains with, uh, with new water mains for upsizing. There's a chart, there's some detailed chart areas with lengths within the report itself. Then again, on the south side of the island, out of right around South Point, there's a big area that really, there's a lot of six inch mains there. So proposed upsizing those with eight inch mains. Okay, before I go into cost, Maybe give a second for any questions regarding, I know that's going through this some a little bit fast, but I uh, just want to see if you guys have any general questions at this point regarding sure. size. Um, uh, since I'm the chair, I'll take the prerogative here. Um, I, st I spent quite a bit of time studying this, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I have some questions. Okay. Um, first of all, since uh, with the state requirements every five years, shouldn't this be labeled reliability study? I mean, are you going to submit it as a master plan or reliability study? That was one of the comments we had from the DEQ, actually. When we, you know, we got some initial comments from them, um, the reliability master plan, they, she kept calling it the master plan and water study. So they prefer to call it the master plan? Yes. Um, all right, I've heard it both ways. Yeah. And I think that uh, <clears throat> somehow in the letter transmittal or whatever, it's certainly, it's clear what you did is it's a reliability study, not just the master plan. Yeah. And uh, somehow you ought to make sure you cover both bases on it. Okay. Uh, on the flow data, I guess I got to back up. Um, oh, the, the question I have on that, when you talked earlier about the flow data, you had the maximum hour, maximum day flow. Did we get that data off of uh, a SCADA system that we out operate, or was it from DWSD? It was from DWSD. It was in their whammer. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that SCADA capability, or do we now with this connection we have with them? We have that capability. But right now, we, we have that capability to check the SCADA system of our own, but the official data comes from uh, DWSD. What a maximum day, maximum hour. That information comes from And does everybody... We can verify that with our system, All right. but they've furnished the data. Does everybody understand what, uh, what we talk about, SCADA system, what we're talking about? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I looked at the, uh, the map, which is on page, <coughs> let's see, uh, the, the, the maps that show the 50 PSI problems, the areas where they fall below 50 PSI. Um, <clears throat> one of the areas is that's pretty clear is on Meridian near, uh, and I don't have a page number for that, is it, is it page 3.5 and 3.6? I think you're right, Yes. Yes. <clears throat> 
Um, well, that's. <coughs> no, uh, page 3-3. Three, three. And 3-4 uh, is what I was looking at. <coughs> um, I just wanted to comment that on page 3-3, three, three, um, so a real low point is near Meridian and Anderson or Westcroft on the other side of the street. And I only note that because we've talked about Meridian before. And um, <coughs> another low point is, um, it looks to me like it's across from high school. On the page three four, be across from the high school on Gray's, and that ought to be a concern, right? It is across from the high school, Barry. Mm -hmm. so that. <coughs> that's yeah, that's a long park lane and then on Gray's park lane. Right right Gray's Drive and Lions. Yeah, that's right across from the high school. Yeah. So that's a that's a. Uh, a low point, although <clears throat> from your map, it looks like that's an 8-inch main there in front of the high school. Yes, it is. So, anyway, I just wanted to highlight that. And, the, and my final question goes to page 4-3, which is the map after you list all the projects you need to undertake. And this is to the commission. If you look at study this map on page 4-3, tell me when everybody's there. What I, what I got out of this uh, report is, um, you know, over the last few years when staff, Barry, basically brought forward capital improvement plan for water, Barry, we've certainly talked about the need to replace the line on East River Road, and the line on East River shows us needing being replaced. On West River Road, from about, is that church? Yeah, church. Uh, to the south, and that shows up as needing to be replaced. I know we've talked about church before. I was curious because it's only you're replacing a six inch line between West River and Thoroughfare, but we've talked about repaving someday soon, hopefully, Church Road all the way to East River, and uh, the need for a replacement of the water main, I guess just because of the size, isn't that great, but it's probably an old water main. I just want, it's not shown though as critical. It's not on your list, but it should be probably on ours because we're going to talk about Church Road next year for eventual something happening to it. And I wouldn't want to pave, I don't know if the Church Road line, maybe less knows, is that under the pavement or is it alongside of it? Alongside of it. So it's not, it wouldn't be affected if we paved over? Well, it's right at the ditch line on Church Road, and then on the other side of the Third Fair Canal, it's underneath the sidewalk. Okay. And it's newer main up until uh, just past Canterbury, and then that is old main, it's 8 inch up until Church, or I'm sorry, Park Lane, and then it, it drops down to a 6 inch to East River Road. All right. Well, you're going to be, now that you're on the commission, you're going to be involved in as we plot what we might do on, for improvements on church, so this is great. Um, my final comment is, this past year we focused a lot of discussion about Meridian, replacing the water line on Meridian for like three, four miles of Meridian, and it doesn't show up on your report as needing to be done. We've had a lot of water main breaks, so I guess the question I throw back for consideration is, do we get a bang for our buck in terms of increasing pressure and reliability by doing the, the line on Meridian since it doesn't show up there versus East River. That's something what, I'm throwing out there. One of the things that just what this chart depicts is the recommended water main improvements based on a minimum of 1,200 GPM per minute. So it doesn't necessarily mean condition of pipe. It means an area which you cannot get 1,200 GPM. So there's, this could there could be other areas in here that need to be replaced. But based on this data, we can get 1,200 GPM in the areas that are specified. I'm you probably don't necessarily understood your answer, but you understand my question. Yes, I do. Yeah, the report itself for the, the recommended improvements, again, based on fire flow here, um, I can't 
As far as the DQ is concerned, we know that there's worse, there's certain uh, pipe in the ground and grow seal that is, that's old, they've had a lot more problems with breaks and maintenance problems than what are showing on here. Um, keep in mind that the best of this plan itself is for providing adequate fire flows. There are definitely some mains, a lot of mains that are in bad shape, age-wise especially, that uh, need to be prioritized for the township for sure. But for the report itself, um, I think that's a good point, I'm glad you brought it up, that this is for fire flow pressure, it would be great, yeah, some of the East River is in bad shape, West River is like that, they have breaks, it will help the system itself, but the impact of replacing some of the button, the main that needs to be replaced just because of the condition of the pipe itself, in certain cases, has well, not that much of an effect on the overall system. All right, well, that's a great answer, and I guess the question to that is, <clears throat> shouldn't this report deal with water main breaks and frequency and outline where there are known to be pipe that are in need of replacement because of their condition? I mean, couldn't we add that to it? We could add it as far as the DEQ is concerned. Yeah, but we can. Or shouldn't we add it to it? Yeah, well, maybe as a... We could easily, you know, insert other maps, too. And, and I got another map I brought with me that's not, you know, part of the DEQ report itself. But there definitely needs to... So they don't want to see it, you say. Yeah, it's not required it. of them, but they probably wouldn't mind if it was added, would they? What we can do, we can have a supplement to this report that uh, uh, includes the capital improvements that the township deems necessary to improve the system, which will include the concerns about the older mains that are uh, experiencing breaks. That could be added as a supplement to this one. But like Kevin said, DEQ would be concerned about fire flows, but I believe maybe we should incorporate the uh, capital improvement aspect of uh, the demand, the need with the township as a supplement to this report. Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I just want to then turn over. My final comment, I think, I think that you need to get with Barry and cover those questions that I asked. Sure. And, and that's some way off base with them. Uh, but that's just a thought. Now, Ted? A couple of questions. <clears throat> The 1100 GPM that you're referring to, is that free flow pressure, open hydrant free flow? Yes. Uh, with the pumpers that we use with our fire department, are we capable of boosting that pressure? Or can we not get any more than 1100 gallons through a six inch pipe? Well, it, uh, well, it did identify the 1200 gallons. You may not be able to get more than that out of the hydrant. So. Um, I know the pumpers that the township has may be able to pump 1,500 to 2,000 gallons per minute, which kind of raises another concern. Do we want them to pump that much out of a hydrant that cannot supply more than 1,200? And that may cause uh, negative pressure in the piping system, cause the pipes to collapse. So um, it would be prudent to identify those areas for the fire and provide them to the fire department so when they go out, they are aware uh, that there are uh, flow deficiencies and maybe they can use collapsible hoses. And I think they do that anyways now between the hydrant and the pumper. So in case the pumper ends up pumping more than the 1,200, should, they do not. So what you're saying is we should be identifying these hydrants? We should be identifying those locations to them, yes. We, we certainly are not going to hand them a map. Should we be identifying them at the hydrant? It is better to identify them at the hydrant, yes. This way they know when they get to it, there'll be a tag on the island that says this island is capable of providing Or a stencil or something saying rating it one through five or whatever. That's correct. That's some communities color yeah. My second question. Our data that we get from our SCADA system on our flow to the island, are we able to measure pressure and flow? Volume or just volume? We come into the island here. We're supplied most times pressure to our master meters that come from the city of Detroit on the other side. I'm getting to it. Around 70 pounds PSI. When it comes to the island, after it comes through the meter, we run it through a PRV, a pressure reducing valve, that gets it down to about 50 pounds in our system. And that's about what we carry over here most times. I'm going to repeat my question. 
do we have a way of metering the pressure that we actually have on the island? Yes, at the north end, in the meter, in the pump house. There's a device there that, that records the pressure. The pressure? Yes. Okay. That's only downstream of the meter. Downstream of the PRV valve. Mr. Venos, if you're looking at pressures throughout the system, you may have to conduct pressure uh, measurements at various locations, static measurements of hydrants at different locations of the island. And we do that. Periodically, we have a list where we go around and we take pressures in our system. Well, I guess where I'm going with this, there's all kinds of conjecture and theory as to what causes water main breaks, age of pipe, uh, ground faults. I even heard barometric pressure has something to do with it, which I don't know that I believe that or not. But, but I think in reality, through most systems, a 10 or 15 pound spike in water pressure uh, coming through our pressure reducing valve if our pressure reducing valves aren't doing what they're supposed to do, can cause havoc, and we'd never know it. It could be a 20 minute spike, it could be a two minute spike coming into these old pipes. Is, is there a way that we monitor or measure our PRVs to see that they're doing what they're supposed to do? Barry, I don't know if you have any means of measuring the downstream pressure through the PRV. Not, not right at the PRV. Okay. I, I'm just curious. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm coming yes. No. Right. We, and, and actually, I would think a 10, a 10 pound sure. or 20 pound surge on a 60 year old pipe can really raise havoc with that pipe. Pressure fluctuations definitely will cause what we call a wire hanger effect on the mains, up and, and down. And, and I guess my next question is, would it be advisable for us to be able to do that? Would it be worth the cost to be able to do that? It would be worth it to make sure that the PRVs are functioning properly and maintaining the pressure that your system is uh, tolerating at this point. I think you're measuring 57 pounds downstream from the city of Detroit. So even if they're sending 70 pounds, your system is not seeing more than the 57 pounds downstream. Right. And again, that dissipates throughout the system right. as uh, you get away from the PRVs. As long as you don't have this... Uh, uh, fluctuation up and down, even if you go from 57 to 47, that's 10 pounds drop, that create the same water hanger effect uh, on and, the system. And I guess my concern is we're relying on a supplied water system from something less than a perfect system being the city of Detroit and their ability to control their delivery system. Uh, we know they've had a problem with it. It's been evident throughout the years that they've had a problem with it. And we've been looking at that. Uh, we brought that to their attention a couple months ago that we have noticed fluctuations up and down upstream of our system. Now, we didn't see it downstream from us, but they were going up. But, to, but I'm not uh, sure we can even measure it downstream if, it's, if, we, if we are capable of noticing that at all times and if we're not sure our pre PRB, PRBs are functioning. completely functional, yeah. we could be experiencing as much as a 10 or 20 pound Darius, and we wouldn't even know it, right. except uh, our DPS department would be really busy the next day digging holes. Yeah, and, and we do experience that at the north end that with, the, that with the pressure device we have in the pump house. We can see fluctuations in pressure. Even though we have our PRV up there, it does make a difference from time to time. So that PRV up there is, well, I can tell you how old it is, it's older than less. Well, it, it just seems to me that that <laughs> should be a, a huge consideration on our part. Sure. If we're going to invest money, uh, that would be a big return on our investment if we can protect ourselves from water main breaks because they're really expensive to fix sure. and they're time consuming. So if I understand this right, Mr. Reynolds, you're looking at means of measuring the pressures downstream of PRVs. And, and ensuring that our PRVs are correct right. and mm -hmm. do what they're supposed to do. Right. And taking a look and see whether the cost analysis, I mean, if we've got to spend $200,000 to fix our PRVs, maybe we ought to fix water mains, but if we can fix our water PRVs for a reasonable price, which I think we can, or ensure that they're accurate for mm -hmm. a reasonable price, then we should be devoting our resources to that going forward. Sure. Right. That was just a thought that entered as we went through right. this thing, Barry and I have had this discussion yeah. before. 
So basically, we cannot increase for fire protection. If we had a six inch main, the most we're going to get out of that six inch main is 1100 or less GPM. If that. Sometimes uh, the six inch main that you have in the ground now may have four inch cross section on the inside after the build up. That's what we have available to pump. And, okay. um, and the, the standard for fire protection is set by the state or the federal government? The state does not recognize six inches as mains anymore, so they like to see all the six inches taken out and replaced with eight inch mains. Okay, cool. Secondly, I noticed on your review chart that on Elba Island, for example, we went up with new 12 inch main when it got down to just about the end of it, it dropped back down to six. Was there a reason we didn't replace the? It would have seen that that project should have gone 12 all the way to the end? I think that uh, the main stopped at the gate and the, the rest of the area is private roads and for some reason um, I don't recall why the township decided to stop right there at the gate. Yeah. You would have been here. No, he wasn't before there. Before your time. Plus, can, do you have any feedback on that? That was planted in there and that's why they stopped. Les, I don't think your mic's working. Push your uh, button up there with a the mute button. That was private property uh, past the gate. And that's why they stopped there with the 12-inch. Because the people down there didn't want us to come in there and tear it up. Okay, cool. I, I just I noticed that it was just a, yep. a curiosity. And what was my other question? I guess that's it. I'm going to go down the table, but Ted, on your comment about skate, I mean, I think a lot of the cities that this past decade that we're getting the high peak flows from the chargers from Detroit started to get more sophisticated skater measuring these systems so they can measure pressures for the very reason you brought up. And um, so I guess, I don't know, I'm not a skater expert by any means, but if there's some data measuring that we should be doing, I don't think you should hesitate to bring it to us so we can better monitor our system. Right. I, I don't think the monitoring from what I'm from what I gathered from what was said here, uh, the question is, is our, our PRVs working properly? Yeah. We haven't ascertained that yet. So I mean, and as soon as we do that, if we can cut, reduce our water main breaks by 50%, 10%, I think it'll pay for any work we're going to do on it. And I think we just need to focus our funds where they're going to do us most good. Yeah, we know as far as the pressure fluctuations, we do get a little bit from the north end. The one, the PRV that we have at the south end here at the county bridge is right in the meter pit itself, and that would, would be either easy to put a probe in to test the pressure on our side of the PRV pretty readily. The one on the north end is in a separate pit, and that one's going to have to be dug up and probably overhauled. It hasn't been touched in, I don't know, last. has it ever been worked on? Yeah, that, that PRV up at the other end is, I don't think it's ever been touched. And I do think we experience a little bit of a spike there once in a while. And John would probably, John watches that pump house pretty closely as far as the pressure spikes. And we will experience a little bit of a pressure spike, but nothing like Detroit's pushing. I mean, Detroit's pressure in so Ohio, and I've been monitoring it now for this, and John for the last few months over the summer, we, Detroit's pressure will go from 80 pounds down to 50 in, 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 in 30 minutes. And then 30 minutes later, go right back up. And we talked to Detroit about that because it wasn't affecting us because of our PRVs that much. But we were still concerned about why is the pressure in Detroit's system fluctuating so much. And we, we have not actually received a, a, an answer to that question. Okay. All right, next question, Wall. Do you have any questions? Nope. John. I had a couple of thoughts. That, um, some of it dovetails in with some other things that have been said. But fire suppression is very important. Uh, historically here on Grosia, we've been fortunate. There was a real bad fire right around Christmas time at Church Road maybe a year ago. And in the 80s, there was a nefarious situation that occurred uh, near the... Uh, Free bridge, and it resulted in a fire, and someone may have been killed at that time too. In between, there are not a lot of fires on Grosil. We're blessed with that factor. 
uh, conscientious people, helpful neighbors, whatever it is. So I'm a little disappointed with government because it seems like the tail wags the dog sometimes as opposed to paying attention to the more important things. With this in mind, if the state says to us, we need to replace all the six inch, that would be just great, and you guys can pay for it, and say it costs a jillion dollars. That's not a realistic number, so I'm not trying to frighten anybody. But then the bonds are sold, the taxpayers pay, the state's real happy, they don't live out here, they're not an individual, and it justifies their existence up there, but it really doesn't improve our conditions down here, where we, maybe we do need to focus on some new water mains in certain areas to cut down on the brakes or whatever it is. And that's a moving target. So if we looked at one place on the island and says, oh, we had a lot of brakes here, let's replace that, you know, as soon as you did that, you'd have some brakes in another sure. area. But what I'm talking about is balance, because uh, the state of Michigan, the economy, is still in a recession. I think realistically people recognize that. There's been some hard times out here for some people on the island, including in some of these areas that I'm seeing have uh, smaller mains. So it's always a question of balance, and it is with everything, not just this issue, it is with everything. But the um, upper-handed MDEQ position that they like to take has been very costly to us in the last 10 years. And I'm thinking about the uh, sewer treatment. Really up, sure. And that was 38 million bucks. And the bonds were sold and the taxpayers are paying it. And that's a significant cost every month. Now, I appreciate you fellas live in a different community and some of the people here that work in our township live in different communities. But the guys here are the ones that pay the bill. And that young family that lives maybe on... Uh, HCL Jackson, they're paying the bill. And there were over about in a several year period, there were many, many, I think I know the number, but it's unimportant, uh, foreclosures where people lost their homes. So if the state comes down to us uh, about 10 years after they were looking at our uh, sewer treatment plant, and they say, hey, now we want you to spend another $38 jillion dollars on one of our new designs here. Maybe at times we have to balance out the welfare of our people with maybe it's a replacing some water main lines someplace as opposed to the fire suppression because if we let the tail wag the dog, it's really not fair to the taxpayers. And I don't know if anybody's standing up for the taxpayers, but I am. That makes sense. And time in data. I'm a little uncomfortable with getting data from the city of Detroit Water Department. And I'll tell you why. Uh, they were studied and some group came in, independence, and they said, well, we can do away with a significant number of jobs and run this independently with far fewer employees. I don't know why that is, but maybe there isn't the attention to detail at the city level that there needs to be. And with that respect, we need to take all our figures and tie them in with our own SCADA data so that we're sure as best we can be, that yes, that information is correct and we can rely on it. Because if you're using these models, let's suppose that the city broadcasts incorrect data to us and we're plugging that into our models, our model's effective. And maybe that's not good. So uh, time in is important. Balance is important. we got to think about the taxpayers. And I hate to have the best fire suppression system in the state of Michigan paid for by the taxpayers and then have water rate breaks all over the place because we don't have to worry about fighting fires. We don't have the fires, but we got water main breaks all over the place because we addressed the wrong area. So it's always a question of balance. I know it's imperfect and I appreciate your hard work that you've done. This report is very important. We, uh, just to uh, just support your point, uh, the state has not yet come back to uh, dictate any replacement. We're going to submit the, submit the report and identify these areas to them, but we don't anticipate them coming back and saying you must replace this within a year, two okay. years. They may be watching and they may like to discuss with Barry. Uh, you have to start doing something, maybe over the next 10 years, 15 years or so. Um, they don't have a mandate yet that can force a township to 
undertake all of these projects instantaneously. We're looking at almost $9 million of improvements just to meet the requirements and replace six to eight so we can meet fire flows. So that's, that's what the uh, breakdown of the estimate that you have in your report shows. Now, that doesn't address yet what Bill, um, uh, Mr. Costick and Mr. Van Oss brought up as far as the other deficiencies in the system that are breaking and uh, causing um, uh, maintenance issues to the township. So that's above and beyond. Definitely you don't want to be in a situation where the state is going to have to come back to you and say, do this, you have to fight back, you have to push back, and everybody's doing the same thing. Especially <coughs> that there are drinking water revolving funds available to communities that are way much with less average income than Grosillo. I have another client that uh, has an average income, almost a third of what the average income is on Gross Hill, and they've been number 40 on the list for the past four years, asking for $3.6 million in funding, and they can't make it up the list. So the funds are not there. Uh, for sure, the accused are going to come back and push and force you to uh, fund those projects unless they can support you somehow, at least at the lower bonding cost and so forth. But, that's so. Mr. Chair. Yep. I just want to make a comment. Excuse me. I remember back in the 70s and 80s when we were required to evaluate our sewer system right. and start the upgrades, and we took basically the same approach you're taking. Uh, you know, we just can't afford it. And by the early 2000s, they came out and mandated it, and we were so far behind the curve that we couldn't have caught up if we wanted to, i.e. a 40 to $50 million sewer project all at one time. I think we need to be really cautious going forward that we do address some of these problems when finances are available, and <clears throat> it, it needs to be an ongoing process. But I don't see finances being available in the near future because we're sitting on a $50 million sewer debt. Or a $64 million township debt, I just don't see these finances being available. But I think we all need to be aware that at some point in time they may mandate you will supply this kind of pressure. And we need to be ready for that too. All right, well, I know this too, that uh, there's a many, many suburban communities that have a lot worse problems than we do. Um, and I know that for a fact. So those are good points. Uh, Jim, you have any comments, questions? Yeah, just, a, just a couple of things. First of all, I, uh, I would say that I definitely uh, agree with Ted uh, as far as the PRV and testing that uh, and look or looking at that uh, because you have to, I, you, the best place to start is at the beginning of your system. Uh, no use stressing it out. Uh, no matter what you put in new, if you're going to get surges or something, uh, that's not going to do us any good. So I, I think that was a good point, and I, I, I would fully agree with that. Um, also, uh, what John talked about uh, dealing with government, and of course we're sitting here, we are government, but uh, uh, maybe we need to look at being a little more proactive with the state and talking to them more and, and getting to the people so that they understand what we're under before they mandate anything. Uh, it, it's, it's always easy to sit back and say, uh, well, they're just bigger and they're not going to listen to us, but it never hurts to talk. Um, and then uh, one last thing, I just, just for my own education and maybe for the people watching this meeting, uh, um, Six inch, six inch main is no longer used. Is that correct? So anything we have six inch is just old. That is correct. Um, they are used for fire suppression system on private supply, but they are not considered public mains. Yeah, That's but right. as far as what we would put in, pretty much it's going to be eight or twelve. Is that correct? Eight or larger, yes. Okay, because uh, in our system, the sixteen twenty four, the the big mains coming in. And we pretty much deal with 12 or 8. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Phil. Two quick questions. Uh, on page 2-2, two -two, when we're talking about the demographics, I just read that that was the 1990 census and projection going forward. 
how comfortable are we with those numbers, or is there was any uh, change of those numbers based on actual data? I believe the 2010 census actually was about 10,300. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I updated some of the flows, but the predictions were close enough where it didn't affect the report. But yes, it's actually okay. gone down. So we're the and, and they, we're pretty comfortable with those numbers. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a long shot when you're going okay. 20 years, but that's using some Cogs numbers. Right. And just one other quick question for my own uh, information on page two six when we talk about the uh, scaling and calibration. Just give me the real quick definition of residual conditions. I, it's just for my own knowledge. I understand static conditions. I just right. but residual conditions. I just didn't make sense from that for me. When you test hydrant flows, you want to test the hydrant. We're assuming another hydrant is open, and that will create a residual pressure for you. Okay. You cannot assume that you always have a static pressure at the hydrant. Correct. You open it, you end up with residual pressure. When you analyze the flows, what you do is you take the factor, the diameter of the nozzle, the C factor, the coefficient of friction of the pipe, uh, some empirical number, uh, I don't know where it comes from. Then you take the static pressure and the residual pressure and subtract them, and you take the square root of that and you apply them together, and that's your fire flow. That's how you calculate it. Now, some fire department has these in formulas. They do a pitot tube test on the hydrant. Um, the way they test them, they don't want to get too much trouble open this hydrant and go test there. What they do is they use something called Siamese connection, where it has two nozzles, they connect it to one. So they open one nozzle and test the other. That gives them the residual pressure. That's how you test them for. And most of the hydrant flows are calculated at 20 pound residual, not static. So, Okay. okay. So the ones where the difference was quite great, the minus 17 on the one, and so that would have in, that would indicate a more deteriorated piping system, or typically yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the more the negative number, the worse the conditions the are in reality. Very compared to uh, absolutely ideal. That, okay. The hydrant Fine. lead was probably it had built up. You know, could be down to a few inches on okay. some of those old So thank you. That, the difference is. I'm glad you mentioned that because you see the static and it's for the model, but there is some big differences for field conditions in the model for the so. Fine. Thank you very much. Good question, Phil. <clears throat> Les. Uh, the PRV valves that are up at the north end of the island, I remember uh, John and I popped that pit out, and John went down there and looked at them. And my suggestion was, I don't know, quite a few years ago, that we build a building over the top of that pit so we have easier access because you're going into a confined space through a small manhole, and when we got down in that thing, it was it hadn't been touched in I don't know how long. I mean, I started here in uh, 1965, and those PRV valves were put in then. So to have those, those there's two of them in there if I'm if I'm right. Now, would you turn on your mic, please? How was that? I believe. No. Maybe he's hitting the wrong button. No, here's, here's this one. Here's this one. Here's this one. Uh -huh. I believe that there's two PRV valves in that pit at the uh, in Riverview. And John went down there and looked at them, and they're both in operation because they come off the 16 and they're, they're looped around. But to get into that pit, it's a confined space, and it needs to have a better access to it. And to be able to get into that thing and work, you need to have a building or a roof over it so you can go into it, like our meter house over in Trenton. And I don't think it would cost that much money to put that on there. Thanks, Mike. So, so Les, I'm Tell me where this meter pit is. It's on the west side of the Tolls Bridge on the north side of Bridge Road. The meter pit for the water meter, Detroit is there, and then to the east of that, this pit was put in and the two PRV valves are in there. So after I go through the toll booth, it's west of there? No. It's before you go through the toll booth. After the bridge, but before the toll yes. booth? Yes. Is that in the vicinity of where uh, we were petitioned to out a hydrant in? Yeah. Close. 
Yes. Okay. Um, so what kind of a building would you envision? Nothing fancy, just four walls and a roof. <laughs> four walls and a roof and a door. That would be about it. With stairs to go down into the pit instead of climbing on a ladder. Okay, so I guess it, uh, I can't envision that, but we'll, 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 maybe sometime you can show it to me. The pit is a, it's either poured concrete or block, I don't know what it is, but then it's got a slab over the top of it. So you can remove the slab so it's open, and then build four walls and a roof over the top of the pit with a door and a stairway. Okay. That's kind of like what, if nobody's been in a meter house over there in Trenton, that's what's over there. How deep is it, would you say? 10, 12 feet? No, it wasn't that deep. Not that deep. It's about, about six or seven feet. Is that correct, John? Yes. All right, well, <clears throat> I guess it, that's a legitimate recommendation. I don't know about timing or anything, but you want to pursue that and... I mean, I don't know. The commission, where, where do we go with that? That sounds like a reasonably good idea. One of the things that we need to do if we're going to do that is we need to either overhaul or replace those PRVs that are in there. Um, in fact, we've got to take the top off the vault, which we cleaned it out not that long ago. We went up there with a the vac truck and cleaned it out. But we never did get down in there to do any repairs to it because there really isn't any repairs that were immediately necessary. But if we're going to put a building over it, we need to take the concrete top off of it. We need to get in there and repair or replace, bring up to speed the PRV valves, and then we can enclose it. We right. need to get some numbers and estimates. Yeah, we could, we could list, when we do our tour in the spring, uh, we could look at mm -hmm. where we're talking, I guess. I assume we have our own easement there. Um, I don't know how it interferes with the bridge, but and then PRV valves themselves can be very expensive. Yes. So I don't know if we want to. It sounds logical to replace them before we put a building over it, but uh, well, there is a company that comes out and maintain them because when I was working, we had them up at the one in Trenton, and he. Cal calibrated it, checked it out, and everything. He said it was working fine. We've had them out a couple times. Also, it's Clay Valves, the name of the yes. company. They come out, and they'll test them, and the, they, the, the one at the county bridge tested okay. The one at the north end, we did couldn't get access to. Mr. Chair, the key yes. hearing the words confined space is that a uh, technical term, or is it just a description of a small place that? It's difficult to get into. If it's a confined space, there's more to it. Than it's a technical to. term because it is a confined space. So there's an entry permit required. Yes. Okay. Just throwing it out there. All right, Les, anything else you want to raise on this? I don't want to make too many points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, I appreciate the work you did on this, and I hope our questions were helpful. I, I know I thought it was a good report. Um, uh, are there any other questions on it? Uh, Barry, do you have any? Yeah, what are, off the top of your head, so high, what, what is the cost of these PRV valves? It depends, uh, it depends on the size. Uh, if you have a 16-inch um, uh, PRV, um, if you're going to overhaul the pit, you need to have a, a bypass PRV also. That's a requirement right. for overhauling them. A 16-inch could be get this could get very expensive. I priced them for uh, one other municipality a couple of years ago, in the hope that Detroit would pay for them, and they refused. Uh, it could get in the order of 120 to 150 thousand dollars. <laughs> and the, the the thing is, for a 16-inch main, you don't have to have a 16-inch PR. I don't you can think make do. it down to 12 inch yeah. That save you quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. And that's my recommendation: is to go down size wise. Yeah. I don't if think the one we have, I, the one we have in there now, is not a 16. I don't believe. No, the two up at the north end are not. 16. Right, right. They're smaller. Yeah. They're probably they're more. Two eights. The two eights. That's yeah, could be. But the one over here in Trenton is a uh, 12 inch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to go smaller will save you lots of money, but you don't want to go less than eight inches on a 16 inch main. Right. But you definitely uh, need a backup. Uh, a bypass PRV so when you maintain one you still have the flows coming through and if you're going to overhaul the pit you may as well like less recommended mm -hmm. just 
put them in a uh, mm-hmm. shed instead of uh, still may having a pit. Is that something that the commission wishes to move forward on? I, I think we should look at some pricing. Okay. I, I really do, because <clears throat> I, I don't think we have a, a number to evaluate what the cost of main breaks are, but we can assume that that is a prime contributor. My big concern is that 16-inch main that runs underneath the water there is 60 years old. Yes. And anything we can do to protect that for as long as we can protect it or until such time as we decide to go with some huge water renovations, I think we need to, I think we should do that. I, I just see that, that that's the scariest part of this whole system for me is that pipe underneath the, the cambridge for sure. Would we? Uh, would you consider approving then, in addition to studying the uh, PRVs, adding SCADA downstream from the PRVs to monitor pressures downstream? Yeah, I'd, I'd, we'd like to look at, at least give us some preliminary costs so we sure. can see if we want to move forward with a project on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to get into the heavy engineering yet because that has to go in front of the board. It will be mostly a budget number for but you. Just a budget you. number so we can see where we're going with this thing and decide whether this commission then can decide whether it's worth moving forward with or if they want to move forward with it, I mean, it's up to the commission to take it to the board. Sure. So <clears throat> if we could get some budget numbers so we know what we're looking at. If you come back and say it's going to cost three million dollars, we might live with what we got. But if we can do it for a hundred thousand dollars, it might be yeah. a, a well invested hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be in the millions. I'm sure it's going to be over a hundred thousand dollars. We just replaced the PRVs. Uh, inserts in Riverview and that cost close to $50,000. Just the inserts from the inside, they yeah. remove the bolts yeah. and well, yeah, they're, they're not so they're not cheap. But, <clears throat> but it may be, again, better to buy new than to repair the existing because sometimes you may not find parts if they're old enough. Sure. So we'll put a budget number together and bring it forward to Thank you. Uh, the department. Thank you. Along those lines, can that be determined with some accuracy? I'll just call it the rebuild. So Riverview said, let's rebuild ours. The, there's two eights. I think that's what John was uh, yeah. mentioning. So, on a rebuild, you'll understand new is better. Sometimes it's once again it's a question of balance. On the rebuilds, if the parts are available, that's an alternative. Sure. We'll have that option. Okay, so also. all I need to do is get the model numbers and that sure. kind of stuff, and then you can we'll determine whether the parts are available. We we'll present that option. The reason we re- rebuilt because one of their meter pits is in the corner of Allen and Sibley. Accessibility wise, they had no choice but to uh, rebuild them because again they couldn't have room or the pit wasn't large enough to replace the existing. So, but again, we we'll look at both options and present both options to you. Great. All right, um, Ted, I'm glad you brought up about the 16-inch underneath the pay bridge. This came up a couple of years ago, the last few, when we, when we talked about the fire hydrant um, uh, over by the toll booth. And um, <clears throat> I have a question. The pipe uh, is laid on the bottom of the river? It's in a trench. It's in a trench. It's, is it encased in a steel? No, but there is cement over some of it. And, and uh, don't hold it in a river. Because when the freighter hit the, the uh, bridge back in 92, there was a diver down. And I was up on the bridge talking to the diver as he was going along, and then all of a sudden he stepped off in this trench. And he said, oh, wow, what's that? And I said, that's the water main trench. And he could see where the freighter went right over the top of the trench and went into the mud on the other side of the trench. So it, it's buried, and it's deep that they didn't have to lower that when they lowered the 8-inch main on the south side when McClough made the big turn. <coughs> so it's it's down there, and it's in a deep trench. So it's covered and encased in concrete? Not all of it. Certain sections of it are certain... Just to keep it from floating down. Yeah, to keep it. To we ever had a leak in that? Yeah, probably. Well, we've checked that numerous times, and uh, you know, shut the valve off on the on the island side, and went over and checked to make sure nothing was the Still meters weren't moving or anything. But well, that's okay. Have we we um, recent years. We've done it since I've been here. Who said that? 
We did. We've done it since I've been here. We, we had a situation on the 16-inch few years ago that the EQ was uh, authorizing hydro excavation or hydro dredging in the vicinity of the BASF uh, sheet piling to uh, clean up some uh, contaminated soil. And we ended up having to stop them because they were getting close to the water main with that activity. So um, they called us on it, and actually they were threatening in, in their tone. But <laughs> we stood our grounds and made them move away from it just to make sure that they don't touch it because they could easily um, remove the backfill off of it. Should have asked for a $60 million bond and tell them to go ahead. We tried them. <laughs> All right, well, if there are no other questions, any from the audience? Mr. Manager, you're here. Yes, sir. Do you have any questions? John? Yes, sir, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. For thank you. A good report. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One comment I have, um, next time you all go down to Barry's office, outside his door, he's got a couple of water mains. One is, uh, uh, I think it's a six or eight inch, but it's all calcified, so... It's a good sample to show you uh, the, how the capacity with mineral buildup is reduced. And then he's got another one that has a hole the size of a golf ball. Maybe it was my golf ball that went into it. Uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, what I thought, and this gets to Lorinda, maybe he's got enough help with Barry, John, now less, is outside the the door to the DPS, there's a little cubby hole, and I thought we should get a table and set up a display with some signs, so that when the public comes in the building, I mean, I'd like to put it in the lobby, but I don't know that the manager would allow that, but make a real nice display of some of this water main in, in, with appropriately worded little signs that would go on that would say, this is a 60-year-old or 50-year-old water main, and it shows how the mineral buildup affects the water main capacity. And uh, just have it as an information item. Now you'd have to add to that that this mineral buildup doesn't cause any health problems in the drinking water, because people go hysterical on that. But I think it's you know we need to do things yeah, like right. that to show um, what we're up against with some of these things. So it's just an idea. The other thing I want to mention is um, looking at our schedule. Our next meeting is December. And uh, I know we always get this rush at the beginning of the year about budget, that we got we got to review the budget. Um, and uh, I asked Barry to bring to us at our December meeting his capital improvement so we can have a capital discussion because that's going to, it may take a couple of discussions. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's going to be on the agenda for the next meeting and that will include uh, our water system, whatever we're going to talk about for next year, this whole question about Meridian, East River, whatever. And this is timely for that debate and discussion. Where we're going to get the most bang for our buck, and then roads, of course, and wastewater plant. Um, so that'll be on our agenda for the next meeting. So this is timely, so thank you. I guess uh, we're done with water at this point? Yep. So you're going to submit the report to the state? Yes. That's the next step. Does this this report go to the township board or just to us? Uh, I think we should probably make the presentation to the board, but obviously not December, probably sometime in January. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Everybody's welcome to stay if you wish. Uh, next item on our agenda, Barry. Uh, there's several manager report items. Don't fall down the stairs, guys. Electronic uh, recycling yeah. event. Y yes, we have um, on November the 17th, there's a electronics recycling event taking place at the Flat Rock Community Center uh, at 28,341 Evergreen. Uh, anyone in the area that has any electronics that they wish to dispose of, um, they can do so free of charge uh, on that day between the hours of 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Um, so anybody that has any electronic uh, equipment uh, that they'd like to, to dispose of, they can swing over there. There's people that are going to be on site to help you take it out of your car, put it in the dumpsters, whatever. Um, that's about the closest one we have around here in the near future. So if you've got anything, then take it over there. 
the next item, uh, yard waste pickup. Um, as you know, in the past, we've always used November 30th as the last day for yard waste pickup. And that was written into the contract, the previous contract. And it seems like out of the five years, three of those years, we needed to extend it a little bit because of the unusual fall that we've had. Um, people are still having leaves to pick up come November the 30th. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen this year. It's pretty much, everything's pretty much down. But in this contract that's coming up for the next five years, um, we've extended that to the 15th of December. So anyone that has yard waste that they still want to set out, this this year it'll be December the 14th. It'll be the last day. That's a Friday, but in the future, uh, roughly the 15th of December will be the day for the last day for yard waste pickup. Mr. Chair, can I make a comment? <clears throat> I, there's a couple of communities up in Plymouth Northville area. When it comes to yard waste. Uh, they have a pretty substantial program, spring and fall, and go bi-weekly, and in some cases monthly in the summertime, because there's just not as much coming out of the lawns, maybe grass clippings, but there's no leaves, very few trees, and that kind of stuff. I was wondering if <clears throat> you could check with our uh, refuge collectors and see if they participate in any of those, what okay. kind of cost savings it could be? Okay. Because you know, I know you know this time of year, in the spring of the year, you got a lot. Sure. But there's probably a month and a half, two months out of the year where we're going around every week, and these trucks aren't picking very much up. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Yeah, that's something we probably can look into. I know um, at the last time that the commission reviewed the uh, the new contract that's taking place. Um, it was discussed with uh, some of the vendors. In fact, I think they put some uh, addendums or additions to their contract about picking up these things biweekly instead of weekly. Um, but I think it was a continuous thing. I don't think it was only in the summertime or only in the winter. One of them was recycle that they wanted to go to biweekly. And well, I, I don't think you can, in spring and fall, I don't. Around here, I don't, yeah. trees. I don't think you can do it. But that's a good point. I'll check with them and see. I don't know if it declines a lot in the summer months or not, but I can certainly check into it and see. Uh, we may, we, we might have to keep a dumpster available mm -hmm. if we do it bi weekly or monthly, where people would have some place to dispose. Sure. Otherwise, it's going to end up in our open space areas and vacant lots. We don't want that. I, I do know that the, the two uh, dump the junk uh, days that they have twice a year here that open space puts on. Um, becoming very popular. There's a lot of people that do use that now. And we probably, on a Saturday and a Sunday, when they collect it down to DPW, there's probably two or three large roll-off boxes of yard waste material that do come in. And the last one was when? Last month? October. We had one in October. And these have turned out uh, to be very successful. Um, we, we pick up a lot of items that, like you mentioned, would end up in open space property, a lot of it. And we don't allow uh, commercial outfits to dump that. No, no, we don't. But we will take a lot of things from the residential people that they can't normally get rid of in their normal trash, like tires. We'll, we'll take tires. Yeah, I mean, yard waste, we don't allow commercial contracts no. to dump, turn or dump the junk. I don't think they do, no. It's strictly residents. Yeah. Okay. We don't, yeah, okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, yes. Just a quick, just a quick comment. Uh, I see a lot of the commercial very the commercial uh, landscape people on the island taking the residential things that they pick up and leaving them there for us to to pick up at pickup time. Uh, uh, down down near where I live. Is that what we're referring to with commercial operators? You mean people who come and do work for you at do your residence and leave the stuff? separate? If, if you have some materials around your house, if it meets the criteria for yard waste pickup, they can set it out in front. They can, okay, that's, yes. okay, fine. Yeah. Thank you. But generally, it, it goes by size, and they okay. don't take very large items. But if you've got brush, you trimmed a bush or something in your yard, or you had a contractor do it, yeah, they can set it out by the road, and, okay. and we'll pick uh, it up. I wasn't sure what you meant by commercial. 
Yeah, it, I think what Ted meant, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if there's a commercial business on town in town and he actually goes out and does work and collects stuff, he can't throw it in our okay, disposal Okay, I've boxes. got it. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is the status update on the drainage pro project on Wilbur and South Point. Um, we received bids last week on the 8th. Um, the low bid was $34,247. And I think we had about $60,000 in the budget for that project. So uh, we're well under budget. We are still waiting for, we had to have a couple of easements in order to make this project happen. And we had to go to a couple of residents over there to get permission to go through their property with the drain line. Uh, there were two of them involved. We have received the permission from one and we sent the documents out to the second one and we cannot get in touch with them. We haven't heard anything back from them. We've sent emails to them uh, with no response. So I don't exactly, we're going to do everything we can to contact these people because this project basically hinges on their consent to go through their property with this drain. So right now that's the only thing holding us up from doing this project. Is is the, Florida? Well, e we, we had an email address for them and they had been corresponding with us via email before and we just thought that it was kind of unusual. We, we sent it out but we haven't heard anything back. Yeah. So we're going to continue to try and reach them to see if there's some problem with it or something that we can kind of work out with them. But right now the project is ready to go. I was hopeful that we could still do it this year, and I think we can um, if we can get this other approval rather timely. So um, we're going to be following up on that to see. What so we if do. you um, <coughs> get the easement, you're you're authorized to just go with. It. Yes. Well, we got to get board approval. With the, this low bid, we'd have to take it to the township board for approval. All right. But everything else, the permits are in place. The only thing we're waiting for right now is this easement <laughs> documentation. Bring that to the board. At the next meeting, pending a pending easement. Um, yeah, we can, you know pending to get the easement. When you get yes. It, so. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. In I fact, I think we're going to have that on our list. Mr. Van Osburg, there are many of them. half the commission here. When's the, when's the next official board meeting? Uh, 27th. 27. This month. I think that's what you should do, Barry, is take it to them pending the easement if you don't have it. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. I think it was it was one of the action items that we were going to have on the board, but we'll we'll okay. right. make sure. I thought it was the twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. Whatever Monday is. Yeah, I think it's the twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. Yeah. Okay. Next item. Uh, the next item is the uh, status update on the Park Lane Elementary School drain project. Um, it's I think Lorenda put them out at your at your desk this evening last week. Uh, we just received Wayne County approval to move forward with that project. So um, whatever the commission would like to do with that now, it's entirely up to them. We can put it out for bid. We can wait until closer to next spring to bid it, which whatever the well, commission desires. What I suggest when I talk to the school board about it, uh, they, of course, would prefer that the drain be built. Uh, if we do it next spring, we're going to... It's going to be a mess. Yeah. So uh, they ask. I mean, in my discussions, I thought it'd be best to wait till after. So I'd like to bid it in the spring. You know, as soon as the snow's gone, we'll talk about it again. But okay. we budget it next year. Uh, bid it in the spring. Oh, we can actually bid it. Yeah, bid it in the spring and, and start construction as soon as school's over at the elementary school. I mean, it's just a two-week job, but uh, no sense uh, interfering with the school. No. So it won't be done for this spring, but it will be done in the future. Okay. Okay, okay we'll, we'll move that forward in the spring. We'll get a bid date around and we'll get it out for bid. And actually, um, you know, there, we were delayed by school board's approval a couple of months. And I understand, but I threw it at them at the last minute. So. Well, like I said, last week late, we just received the letter from Wayne County approving uh, the project uh, as far as they were concerned. In other words, the authorization of the permit. So. Okay. Uh, the last item is a status update on the wastewater treatment plant boiler replacement. Um, the boiler is in place. Um, I talked to Joe this evening. The major steam piping is in place. And Joe, you can, it's just the, the hooking up of the electronics and some of the small piping and stuff that has to be done. And I believe that um, 
their schedule was for completion before the 26th or on the 26th of November, and I haven't heard anything that uh, would change that date. So by the 26th, we should have it up and running. Monroe Plumbing and Heating has been the contractor over there, and I think they've been doing a fine job for us, um, uh, getting it taken care of and getting the materials timely. Uh, other than that, that's about all I have. Yeah, the wastewater plan, I would just comment to Ted, I don't know if you want to say anything, but uh, uh, as a follow-up to some of the uh, th discussions we've had, um, the Township Treasurer, Ted Botman, uh, our own Ted, has uh, uh, solicited a proposal from the contractor to look at some of the minor repairs that need to be done. And you have a whole list of those now, Ted. And I do. I guess you're working with Joe Keith at the plant. To yeah, in fact, I'm going to meet to a contractor over there this week and start to move forward on some of the stuff. I'm making sure sort of now is heat that will be up and running. Uh, the incident, did you do anything about the unit on the roof of the RBC building? Uh, it's still collecting pulse. Okay, fine. We got that one unit on the RBC building that's not being used. Uh, it's kind of deteriorated, so I told Joe to get some proposal, get some quotes. It's a pretty minor job to look that thing off and put a cap on it. But we're not going to replace it at this time. So right, as soon as we get those numbers, we'll get that thing yanked off the roof. And other, other than that, everything else is pretty minor. All right, and, and I would ask that for the December meeting, if, if there's a list of repairs that you envision that we should be budgeting for next year, that we should bring those forth. And Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. At the wastewater plant. Um, discussion items. Are there any discussion items? Anybody ask? All right, we'll pass that item. Action items. We have two <coughs> for the wastewater plant. Barry? Uh, yes, the first one is the um, additional software that we need to purchase to operate our computer systems in the plant. And I'll give you a brief overview, and then Joe can kind of fill in the gaps for me a little bit. But at the wastewater treatment plant, we have three uh, computers that operate our systems over there. And up until last week, um, we had one of them of the three that was still running and taking care of the systems. Well, last week, the third one that we have and the last one failed. And we need to uh, purchase some additional software uh, to get at least one computer up and running so we can maintain the systems in the plant. Right now, um, the plan is set to run. It isn't changing anything with the plant as long as things running running normal. If we would have a, a heavy rain event or something where we had to change some of the settings in it, that we would run into probably some difficulty. So based on that, um, basically in an emergency situation, we needed to get about $6,000 worth of software to put into this one computer so we can get it up and running to get the plant operating until we can uh, get the additional approval from the township board to spend the additional money for the additional software. So, Joe, if you want to add anything to that, you can. Yeah, the software is, uh, basically you heard SCADA banded around tonight. It's for the retention basin. <coughs> um, so, <coughs> It's also to upgrade it so that when we do the flow study next month or in, in January with uh, OHM, they'll be able to retrieve the data from the, the basin. Um, yeah, it's basically it's a human machine interface software, so we could actually go in and make changes to the PLC and stuff, and that's what it does. Any questions? Yeah, I... I now, the number you're showing here is for fifteen thousand eight hundred and forty-five or eight eight hundred and fourteen. Now, this is this in, in addition to the last. Well, this is yeah. As if you read down in the history portion of it, we were before the township board here a month or so ago and got approval to purchase $7,000 worth of software. This $15,000 is in addition to that seven. But in that 15000 
is the six that we just had to spend on an emergency basis to get one computer up and running. So, in essence, we still need the approval to spend the $15,800 in total, but we're going to be getting the approval for six of it after the fact. Well, this action item is for 15. That's right. In, in, you, if you look at the sheet number 32. Okay. Okay. The part that we had to order was C in order to get one computer up and running, and that was the $5,995. We needed to get that one on an emergency basis to get at least one computer up and running, so we did that. We issued a purchase order for that $6,000, and I think it went out the other day. But it was part of the overall 15 that we're requesting from the Township Board as approval. And that 15 will address two more computers? Yes, the 15. Or one more computer? The 15,000 will address the other two. Am I correct, Joe? I believe so, yeah. Well, no, that's not good enough. <laughs> I don't have, I don't even have that. We have the board. They made a request for funds that weren't adequate. I, I don't want to go back a third time. No, you won't be going back a third time. Well, if you look at this report on this page 32, it says A and B are for licenses for two computers, which I assume are new. And then item D is furnished to historian client and basic Cal and MS Cal per devices. That's for the other two computers. And the E is installation of of the new upgrade Wonderware packages for the two additional computers. Right. right. So I can feel comfortable when yes. we approve this and take it forward to 15000 Yes. Tail yeah. between my legs that this is, <laughs> this is it. Yes, that okay. should be it. Right. <laughs> I'll make the motion. Support. We supported that we recommend the Township Board to purchase Wonderware storing software the wastewater treatment plant sewage retention basin computer terminal in the amount of $15,814, which includes installation and setup uh, in accordance with the attached proposal. Mr. Chairman, For the, uh, I have one, one quick question. Sure. Page 33, uh, the, uh, the 15000 was dated October 12th. On page 33, it says that the Price is good for 30 days. That would be November 12th. I'm sure uh, they'll hold it. it yeah, they, they have, they have we, extended it. To go back to Ted's, are we are we sure yes. these are going to hold? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Think. We, we talked okay. to the guy. The price is okay. Yeah. Any further questions? If not, all in favor, give it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's passed. Next item, Barry. Next item is also a wastewater treatment plant issue. And it's to motion to recommend to the Township Board to authorize repair of the Channel Monster located at the wastewater treatment plant. The estimated cost is $14,000, and that basically is a single source item. Um, Joe, if I could give him a little background on the Channel Monster. Yeah, this, it's a grinder that's, there's two at the plant, and there's an uh, even larger one at the basin. But it's the bigger the two at the plant. They run 24-7 in the sewage, grinding up the big stuff coming in. The teeth wear, the bearings wear, uh, they need to be overhauled about every five or six years. And this is to take it out and ship it down to them, to the manufacturer, and they basically just overhaul the whole thing and ship it back. And, and, and by the way, too, this is um, a capital improvement on this year's budget. Okay. It's in this budget. You can I have a motion. So moved. Support? Support. Well, we supported that the, uh, the on the recommendation. I'll read it, reread it afterwards. But to replace the channel monster. Uh, any discussion? Questions? Everybody's read the report, and uh, on the back side on page 35 this is the budget. Uh, so, if there are no further questions, I'll, uh, it's been moved. Supported that the channel monster, which is a grinder at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, which has been in service since 2001, is wearing due to continuous operation. It grinds larger stuff or grinds larger materials found in the sewage. Uh, and the item is listed in the five-year capital improvement plan. Uh, if there are no further questions, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? You can purchase the grinder monster. Yes. 
just one quick question on the uh, monster or monsters. Are there two of those, Joe, or there's just one? one? This is to repair one. There are two. Uh, is the 14,000 going to take care of two? No, no. Just we, we, we alternate them uh, so that in a couple, like three more years, we'll do the other one. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Okay. Um, is there any? Uh, it's now time for public comment. Is there any comment from the public? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, chairman's report. There's a couple items in the packet, real quickly. One is the the roster, and uh, I know that uh, this evening Les I think gave some additional material information to to uh, Lorinda to update the roster and it'll be mailed out. Um, if anybody sees anything that's incorrect or would like to submit more information such as a cell number, um, that would be good. So you all have an updated roster and uh, it's, it's always good if we can have a cell number so that if we have to make a change or have an emergency we can get a hold of you. I noticed Jim, you, yours is not listed, so if you want it, don't give it now. Um, I won't. <laughs> another thing as we go forward, uh, we need to update the committee assignments. So next week when, or next month, we should talk about committee assignments as well. Yeah. Have that on the agenda. And our committee makeup. Sure. So we should do that. Uh, Mr. Chair, could we get a copy of the standing committees? To all the board members by email, and that way we can say what we're interested yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at this list. The only ones I see here are uh, water and sewer, capital improvements, roads and bike paths, and refuse. Yeah. Are there other committees? That's about it. That's about what we have. And of course, refuse, right at this point, we just went through right. that and yeah. renewed our contract. So for the next five years, unless we come up with a new committee, we have capital improvements, roads and bike paths, water and sewer. Well, you can take um, bike paths off of there now, too. Yeah. And we can take bike paths off there, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, the committee system was used to really get into specific studies when we had an issue that would take sure. too much time for the whole commission. All right. The next item is um, in your packet is a copy of the letter I sent to, to Ron Agasinski, direct, the new director of engineering, about our resolution involving East River Road and the request for improvements this next summer in 2013 at, and along East River Road at the intersections of Church, Island Boulevard, and Stout Avenue. So you have my letter. I will tell you that yesterday I placed a call. I haven't heard anything from the county. This went out uh, some time, some weeks ago. And I haven't heard anything from the county. So I tried to reach Mr. Agasinski and pick the wrong day because it was... Veterans Day, but uh, I expect to talk with him this week and uh, left him a message saying I'd like to meet. So um, I'm going to try. If you remember, our resolution asked for some commitment from them by December 1, and uh, for whatever that means, we're going to try to meet with him before then. Okay? He's the new uh, county highway engineer. We also have in our packet a letter from uh, Joe Keefe uh, regarding their contract and required adjustment in their contract and that's in there for your information. I don't have any further comment on that. And an article from DWSD about uh, the new, the ninth CSO, Combined Sewer Overflow Treatment Facility, which is put into operation. And then Barry included a book, uh, a pamphlet from the Michigan Water Environmental Association regarding wastewater management. It's kind that, of interesting. Yeah, that was actually given to me by Joe. Uh, you put that. All right, that by Joe. Thank, thank you, know. Joe. So at your leisure, you can call Joe and ask him any questions. So, uh, might be in there. Um, all right, I I have an issue um, that I wanted to bring up. We had we have a sub subcommittee that, that talked about roads and um, Frank Kent as you know was on that and we never did get together um, but one concern I have is um, what are we going to do about LaSalle and maybe we want to have a meeting with the residents of LaSalle maybe we want to wait till spring if you 
should test those things. Distributing some materials here. I have copies for you too, Lorinda. Um, and then, Ted, I'm going to hand you two extra copies for. Thank you, sir. There's two more copies. Uh -huh. All right, what I just distributed to you, um, and, and this is new, I guess, for, this is new for you, Phil, I think, and for um, Les. Uh, I know Les knows where the South Court is. Do you know where the South Court is? I was here when this was discussed. Oh, okay. Yes. All right, well, um, the history is, is that uh, we've talked about it over the years, and um, it's in very bad condition as we all know. And uh, <clears throat> so we put money, we said we would agree to, as we talked about our capital this year, we picked a figure of $45,000 and said we we're going to set it aside to put towards LaSalle. It's a, a small cul-de-sac that has nine homes on it and one vacant lot. And uh, it's a dead end. It's a concrete road. And I attempted this summer to get a meeting set up with the residents to start some discussion about how we might move forward. And uh, uh, short history, it just uh, that didn't take place. Uh, the person I was dealing with said that, you know, until we, we come up with a solution where there's no cost participation on the part of the residents, they weren't interested in talking, or that person wasn't. Uh, nevertheless, it's a road that uh, is in bad shape. What I distributed is uh, the last cost estimate we had for it, which is $128,000, including contingencies and engineering. And then <clears throat> some time ago, uh, the staff had put together, if we were to assess some figure, and, and I know we just talked in generalities about, let's just say we had a $4,000 assessment. When we did a couple of other roads, um, I think Lake and Rucker, some year, some five or six years ago, the assessments were four thousand dollars, or right around there. So we just hypothetically picked a figure to say, well, what would the assessment payments be? And the payments looked at to be, for principal and interest, they would be about three hundred. If you spread it over fifteen years, a four thousand dollar assessment, at two percent interest, which is about one percent over what we're charging now, or what we're earning now, which is the way the statutes read. Uh, that payments of about three hundred and eleven dollars. Now that's just an approximation because we don't have a real project in front of annual us. Payment. Annual payment of principal and interest. So I hypothetically just on my own threw a, a cost sheet together and said, "Well, all right, we the cost is one hundred twenty-eight thousand, and we and we said we were going to set aside forty-five thousand this year. What will we set aside next year for the road?" And of course, we're all concerned about um, how much money we put into this and of our money that's available for road improvements throughout the township. And then we talked about maybe we'd put some drain money in, and the drain cost for the edge drain was was in the vicinity of fifteen thousand dollars. And if we assessed four thousand dollars a lot, one of the lots is a corner lot that uh, doesn't have a driveway on LaSalle. And so it does on Park Lane. So I just threw a hypothetical. I don't know what the policy on the township is on a corner lot, but uh, normally it's half of what the other assessment would be. So we that would raise thirty-eight thousand, and that would require in order to, if we were to do it next year, uh, require another payment from us of from our road fund of thirty thousand dollars. So in total, we would have um, seventy-five thousand into it. Residents 40 and 15 from the drain fund. Under this scenario, okay. My my purpose in throwing this out is uh, I don't know of a better um, suggestion on it, but should here we are in November. Should we try to meet with the residents of LaSalle property owners 
um, before the year ends or wait till spring or uh, does this does this scenario uh, how do you feel about this scenario mr. Chair? mr. Well, yep go ahead Wally the uh, conversations been had before on this and we had one gentleman alleging to represent the community mm -hmm. of nine people is that gentleman still in that position or have you got any well, I don't know I, of anything different I have no indication there's any difference but I I guess the question is do we let that person st well he's just one person as far as I know should we move forward with some something in spite of him that's my question well, that's one of the worst subdivision roads in the township and I'd like to see some forward direction on it personally uh, I would suggest sending everybody on that road a letter and inviting them to a meeting and let's see what reaction we get is that that's where I'm that's what I'm asking yeah, that, I guess I agree that's how I feel we should do something so that we're not accused of doing nothing we're, we're, we're now in a situation where we're doing nothing Right. And we're, we're offering a, an alternative that's different than the alternative that one gentleman requested. Uh, it's time to it's time to kick it off at that center. Let's get it. Let's get a meeting together with all nine property owners. Let them pick the date and the time. Give them give them an opportunity to, to discuss amongst themselves. And, and Tom, we're not interested in having one person represent nine. We're interested in having nine people represent nine. We'd like to hear everybody individually. And, and whatever position they, they galvanize themselves into at that point, that's the situation we're going to deal with. We can let them come in and say, no, we're not paying anything. Then we have a decision to make. If seven of them came in and said, uh, you know, we're tired of this road, we'd like to, we'd like to pay $300 a year and get a good road out of it would make our property values go up by $20,000, then we would have a uh, we'd have a consensus, a different consensus than what we have right now. We're dead in the water right now. Let's go for a meeting. Other comments? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would echo what Wally's saying. I think we, we need to talk to him. Uh, before we go too far into this, uh, I think we need to find out how interested they really are. We know they want another road. We know they want it fixed, but how much is of, uh, how interested are they in working with us? Uh, it's, it, it is not our, our job or our requirement to fix that road. It's a Wayne County road. Uh, we know Wayne County isn't going to do it and we're willing to help them, but we haven't haven't really seen any any real interest from them other than the one meeting here where about I think six or seven of the people and there is ten not nine there's that you know there's an owner of a vacant lot there so uh, he's he's in the mix too uh, but we need to gauge their interest before we start pro I think before we start promising any money or uh, uh, to any more money to this we need to see what they what they're willing to do and the only way we're going to do that is if we we get the meeting and get it as soon as possible so we have the time to budget it correctly uh, and I I would I would say that gentleman that sent you the letter uh, speaks for one person himself yeah so would you be willing to schedule it uh, before our next meeting say at 630 that'd be before fine with me. commission meeting just invite them into an information meeting. Mm -hmm. How does that sound, there? Sounds fine. Is that okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Uh, I went over and looked at that road also, and it is in deplorable shape from all the salt that's been dumped on it. Canal Drive used to be the same way like that, and the county came in, and they put two inches of asphalt on top of that cement road. They fixed all the cracks and the, the bad spots and then they put a two-inch cap on that road. Mm -hmm. If you look at Canal Drive, you'll see it's, it's asphalt. But underneath that two inches of asphalt is a concrete road. I mean, that's a simple fix, and I don't know what it would cost. But you could go well, to the yeah. county and say, look at you put a cap on that, that road. That, that's a good suggestion. I mean, that's an alternative we could throw out. Um, I guess I'd like to get a cost estimate for that, because what you're going to end up with is asphalt... Um, 
Now, now, there's a risk that you know it will reflect through the the problems that they have there, and we don't know that that'll how that'll work. Um, <clears throat> the county, we've asked the county if they would help with this project, and they've said, you know, they're out of money now. When they did Canal Drive, they participated in local roads, but they're not doing any neighborhood road improvements now. They'll do patching, they'll patch potholes, but they won't do any paving. So um, I just feel like we've been doing nothing on it, and we should move forward with something on it. So without, if, if everybody's okay, we'll schedule it for 6.30. We'll invite them into an information meeting, and um, I'll prepare something to mail out with an invite. Sounds good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's my report. That's all I have. Uh, we'll go around the table. Um, we'll start with Les. Anything else you'd like to bring up, Les? Not tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Phil? No, sir. Jim? I'm all set. Nothing further. Okay. Thank you. Nothing well, further. And Ted? I just want to again welcome Les on board. And I think we have one more candidate for our DPS commission. Jim brought him to me today. I think we've already reviewed him. He well, I also have a candidate. I haven't shared with anybody, so. Okay. Well, that's good. It looks like we'll, because we'll have two positions available after the 20th. So for our next meeting, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have two positions open on All this right. commission. So, and, and I guess the last thing. There's been a lot of news about the Detroit water system and the turmoil and how they're going to save all the money and lay off all the people or whatever they're going to do. Uh, just it, it, I get people commenting to me now that it should have some effect on our water rates. Please understand that uh, the entire labor force of the Detroit water system only constitutes about 11% of their whole budget. So I think she's going in the right direction to try to save money, uh, but the impact of the Detroit water system will be in their debt, and that's $8 billion, and I don't know that we'll see that in our lifetime. I know I won't see it in my lifetime. Ted, what you just said, uh, did you say that of the total DWSD budget, only 8% or 11% 11 is, is salaries and wages? Labor. $8 oh. billion of it, or 58%. Is debt. <laughs> Current debt. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, plus, we know there's a need for a lot of capital yeah. improvement. They don't need, they, they, they're afraid to estimate the last numbers that I heard them speak about was what, 12 to $15 billion in infrastructure upgrades? Billion. On top of the eight they already have. So, I, I don't look for any improvement on from the Detroit water side. There could all. be another factor. Yeah. Appreciating everything he said. Yeah. Uh, federal bankruptcy judges deal with debt regularly, and they have with Chrysler and they have with General Motors. Those two entities have a few more people than the city of Detroit, but that type of situation looms as a reality. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. If that does happen, the federal judge appointed for life, used to dealing with big numbers, he probably can deal with those deaths too. Sure. Oh, I'm sure. If it, get, if it gets down to that, uh, when the emergency manager was coming in, that was one thing. Without an emergency manager, there's been a lot of avenues that have closed. And you're right. You're absolutely right. As, as scary as it sounds, there'd be a lot of people hurt. But that's very possible. Very possible. Yeah. All right, well, before we close, I just want to thank all of those members of the commission that have been elected to the Township Board for your service, not knowing who will be back or uh, when that will occur, but um, thank you all for your advice, counsel, and service, to Ted and Molly and Jim. Um, <clears throat> I trust one of you at least will be back. So we'll go from there. So thank you. And uh, if this commission puts out junior politicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. All right, well, listen, uh, if there's nothing else to bring up, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Meetings adjourned.